2021 has finally come to a close and 2022 is upon us. Our first major release of the year comes out this weekend. But before we talk about that, as always, we're going to take a look back at last year and I'm going to tell you guys what were my favorite movies of 2021. In 2021, I saw 128 new release films. These were movies that either had a wide or limited release, debuted on streaming, or that I saw at a film festival in 2021. Now, I didn't get to see all of the movies that I wanted to this year, but I am really happy with my list as of today. Now, if you don't see one of your favorite films in my top 10 and you wanna know where it falls on my list, you can click the link in the description where you can see a definitive ranking of all of the films that I saw last year and not just my top 10. And if you still don't see your favorite film or a movie that you loved on my list, you can go ahead and comment and I'll try and check it out. All right, guys, before we get started, I wanna shout out a few honorable mentions for the year. My top 10 was a pretty tight race and was down right to the wire, to the day even, of what it would be exactly. So there were a handful of movies that I love but just didn't quite make the cut into my top 10. At number 15, we have The Feast, followed by Test Pattern, then Malignant, Red Rocket, and Riders of Justice. Truly, this was an excellent year for movies, so it was definitely going to be a tight top 10, but regardless, give all of these movies a watch and let me know what you guys think. You can hit me up on Twitter. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Also, last honorable mention, but I wanted to shout out Bo Burnham's comedy special, Inside. By far, that was my favorite thing that I watched in 2021. I was so blown away by what Bo was able to accomplish with that special, but I think Inside is just that. It's a comedy special. For me, me, that was not a movie, but regardless, I wanted to shout it out here. I know there's some discrepancy about that online, but I wanted to let you guys know where I stand on that. And if you want to see some more in-depth thoughts for myself about that special, you can click the link at the end of the video where it'll take you to a video essay I made all about Bo Burnham's inside. All right, guys, enough with the chit chat. It is time and kicking off my favorite movies of 2021. We have at number 10... Kicking off my list at my number 10 spot is the documentary Flea, directed by Jonas Poer Rasmussen. This documentary has not been released widely across the country yet, so if you haven't had a chance to see this yet, take this as your recommendation to do so. The film follows a young man who, for most of his life, has been hiding who he truly is, both in regards to his own sexuality, but also as a refugee from Afghanistan. Now, not only is the story this documentary chronicles absolutely devastating, but the way in which it is told is equally as beautiful too. Now, to protect the identity of the subject of this film, this entire documentary is told through animation. And despite the fact that you never actually see the face of its subject, I don't think that in any way is detrimental to my connection, my emotional connection with this film, because this documentary is able to still tell such an emotionally resonant story. And it's a film about trust and how, because of the life he had to lead, this man is able to slowly begin to peel away the layers of himself, sort of relinquishing that fear of not being accepted. Not only is this film truly harrowing, but it is one of the most human pieces of filmmaking that I saw in 2021. And speaking of heroin, we have Mass, written and directed by Fran Kranz. And this follows two sets of parents who gather together several years after a tragic shooting to reflect on what happened that day. One set of parents is the father and mother of one of the several victims from that day, and the other two... They're the parents of the shooter. Now, if the title alone didn't let you guys know, the subject matter certainly would, that this movie is pretty heavy and in a lot of ways reminded me of a modern day recontextualization of a story like 12 Angry Men. Because like that film, you're following a group of people in a room trying to understand the perspective of the opposition, ostensibly, while also reconciling with their own shortcomings. 
Airplanes. This film really just kind of hit me like a Mack truck, and not just because of the powerhouse performances in this film, all of which I think are deserving of award recognition, but also this concentrated conversation that we all have been having as a nation for decades is really encapsulated so perfectly in this movie. This film completely avoids being preachy or overly sentimental or saccharine, and honestly just left me completely devastated, yet also hopeful about what can happen when there's an opportunity and an avenue for open communication and understanding. Writer-director Jane Campion has returned with her newest feature film, made exclusively for Netflix, and this was actually my first time experiencing a Campion film, so I really did have no idea what to expect. But even so, wow, was I just blown away by this thing. It really has this gripping, taut suspense running throughout the entire film, and Campion seems to have so much trust in the actors as well as the audience, most importantly, in this film because so much of this movie is in subtlety of a single look or a glance, and how that is able to speak towards these characters and their motivations and what they're struggling with. I think this film also plays so well as a subversion of audiences' expectations and what we may see play out with a story like this, which makes for just a jaw-dropping finale. This film is so powerful and gripping and features some of the best performances and direction you will see all year, I can promise you that. The latest addition to my top 10, Johan Trier's The Worst Person in the World, is truly a brilliant and modern redefining of the coming-of-age film. It follows a young woman throughout her 20s as she jumps from major to major in college, guy to guy, and essentially just kind of also jump ship whenever there is even the possibility of permanency in her life or commitment. And I think something that I found so relatable about this movie, almost depressingly so, is how during this stage in your life, you really are sort of waiting for things to begin. And once you encounter these perceived obstacles that seemingly that sense of autonomy that you have at this age you don't want to relinquish that and you don't want to let that go I don't want to dive into this film too much so I will say that this movie is perfectly balanced between a sense of melancholy and humor the performances are excellent give it a chance if you have the opportunity You know, when it comes to the idea of the quarantine film, a movie that was made in the COVID times with COVID restrictions, the idea of not only having to live through this time, but to experience it cinematically as well is, you know, it's truly exhausting, which was why I was so pleased to see Natalie Morales's language lessons tackle these COVID times, but in such a creative and fun way. Yes, this was a film that was made in the pandemic, but it is not about the pandemic. And instead, a lot of the themes and ideas this movie examines about connection and how because of technology, we are able to maintain or even establish these connections, especially during a time of crisis, can be really crucial, which resonates in these COVID times. This movie was such a surprise and is so, so lovely and sweet and funny and endearing, and it just felt like the biggest hug in a time where we all could probably use one or two. All right, kicking off my top five is the newest film from writer-director Mike Mills, and shocker, he made a movie that made me cry. Seriously, like the last five minutes of this film, throughout the entire theater that I saw this in, you just heard like scattered sniffles throughout the entire auditorium. When the house lights came up when the movie was over, everyone was just sitting there crying. It was the most endearing thing in the world. And it's not even because this movie is really sad, because it's not. This film is just so touching and so human, and features two beautiful performances from Joaquin Phoenix, Gabby Hoffman, and also Woody Norman too. It actually is kind of difficult to really verbalize or pinpoint why this movie affected me so much, but I think something I did find poignant about this movie is how it is able to capture emotion, and not just from the actors. I feel like I could feel this movie, if that makes sense. There's a deep sense of empathy that I have with the events happening on screen, and that overwhelms 
overwhelming, you know, sort of sense of uncertainty with in regards to new surroundings, new stages or transitions in your life. 2021 really was a big year of transition for myself and many others. And the fact that this film really embodies a lot of the emotions that I, and I know some of you probably watching too, felt this year really just resonated with me. Such a beautiful movie. Now, I did have some in my honorable mentions, but I don't have a single horror film in my top 10 this year, which is quite surprising. I will say, though, Shiva Baby is the one that gets the closest to being a horror film. My God, did this movie make me anxious. This film just had me feeling uncomfortable for about 78 minutes. Uh, this film is able to capture so perfectly the feeling of social anxiety and the awkwardness of being in your 20s and trying to explain to relatives what you're going to school for and what you want to do for a living. And the thought of having to endure something like that, as well as a lot of the crazy stuff that happens in this movie, is honestly scarier than almost anything that I saw in a horror movie this year. Shiva Baby is also really hilarious in just watching this quiet chaos unfold at the Shiva. This is streaming right now on HBO Max, so if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you check it out. Please, you will not regret it. Now, I typically am not the biggest fan of biopics, especially in recent years, but I think Spencer is a prime, perfect example, if not the best example, of how these biopics should be operated. Talk about painting a portrait of its subject. This film is able to encapsulate this person's entire essence in just under two hours. Instead, we see an influential week in her life, showing her relationship and dynamic within the royal family, and I felt like this provided a far more in-depth portrayal of this person, who, by the way, is portrayed by a pitch-perfect performance from Kristen Stewart, who seems to be getting snubbed this award season, which is mind-blowing to me. She is just one of the many components that makes up this gorgeous and sometimes horrifying portrait of one of the most publicized women of the 20th century. And while we're on the subject of great performances, without a doubt, one of the most overlooked and underappreciated performances of 2021 is by far and away Nicolas Cage in Michael Cernoski's directorial debut, Pig. My God, this movie completely blindsided me. What was initially marketed as this kind of John Wick-esque movie with Nicolas Cage trying to find his truffle pig genuinely could not have been farther off the mark. This movie completely floored me on all fronts because it really does tell this devastating story about loss and inspiration, where or even who we find that in. It's just a, such a soulful examination and an intimate and understated subversion of the tropes you would expect to find in a revenge movie like John Wick or Death Wish. But instead of giving us something like that, it instead offers a deeply soulful deconstruction of that subgenre. And if you haven't checked this movie out, please give it a chance. It is streaming right now on Hulu, and I hope you love it as much as I did. All right, folks, we've made it. 2021 was a year full of some ups and plenty of downs, and movies were no exception to that. But there was a film that I saw this year that above all all others truly amazed me on every front, and that is my number one favorite film of 2021. Over the years, I think fantasy films have really missed the mark for me. These Arthurian legends of knights and shining armor have really defined storytelling for centuries. And what David Lowry was able to do with this film and offer this truly stunning deconstruction of that myth and others is nothing short of astounding. When I say every facet of this movie floored me, I mean it. This film features stunning cinematography, costumes, music, performances too, that honestly, I found to be pretty unforgettable. Modernizing these types of stories for a modern audience can be really risky. We've seen that tried and tried over again throughout the years, but 
This one really is more than just a facelift for these mythic tales, instead is a complete autopsy of not just this story of Sir Gawain, but really like the entire Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and these mythological heroes that we've passed down throughout generation after generation, and questions why we even bother to do so in the first place. How is this sense of nobility obtained? Is it even worth it at all? The Green Knight really is a film that truly embodies the idea idea of showing and not telling. And I think there is something to be applauded here by how Lowry is able to trust his audience and providing us with just enough to allow these ideas and these motifs to still be effective and clear, but doing so in a way that allows room for discussion and interpretation. This is not a film that gives you all the answers. It is an art house movie through and through. So I know it will not be for everyone, but boy, was it for me. Well, guys, that is a wrap on 2021. Like I said, you can click on the link in the description to see where I ranked all of the new release films I saw in 2021, not just my top 10. And if you want to see what I thought was the worst movie of the year, well, that's there too. And if you didn't see your favorite film on that list, well, let me know. I'd love to know what your ranking was. What were some of your favorite movies that you saw this year? Guys, look forward to 2022. I've got a bunch of fun stuff planned for you guys, so make sure you subscribe and also follow me on Twitter so you do not miss a thing. As always, guys, thank you all so much for watching. I'm looking forward to another great year with you all. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.